Welcome. Welcome to another Q&A here at Digital Boost. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting Phil Howie from Onwardly. And Phil and I were talking earlier about his platform and the cybersecurity platform that you have. And you're going to tell us a little bit more about that and about you. But today, we're going to talk about getting cyber resilient. So three steps to protect your businesses. It's amazing, Phil, how much we're talking about this right now. This has been a subject for the ages. Like it's in the zeitgeist. Everyone's talking about it. I said this to you earlier. It's not just the security people who are talking about it. We've got our social media people talking about it. Our marketers talking about it. We've got, um, who else did we, we had accountants talking about it and all for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's all, it's all on our minds. Like welcome everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here at the webinar. So thanks for hosting me. Uh, and look, it, it is really, I mean, I think ever since COVID times, it hasn't really slowed down. Uh, you know, it's easy to, 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 to talk about the doom and gloom around this. I won't try and do that too much. I think everybody's aware of that, but it's something we kind of need to take seriously. And I think, you know, along with privacy, it's now just kind of table stakes. You know, I'll, I'll get into the presentation in a second, but it's really, it's not really optional anymore, you know, and that never really was, but I think people now are waking up to the fact that this is kind of mandatory if you want to do business, particularly if you want to do business internationally, it's, uh, you know, we really need to kind of up our game here. So hopefully we're going to help yeah, everyone think, today. Yeah. I know. I think the analogy that I love to use that I've, I've heard before is we wouldn't leave our doors unlocked to your house, to your physical home. You wouldn't leave your door unlocked. So why are we keeping a space where, you know, the ghosts in the ether can get in, the man in the machine can get in. We really need to learn now. And it's just about educating ourselves on what that looks like. What are the locks on the doors? How do we get in ourselves? What are our keys? So this is, this is really exciting. I love having you here and I love what we're going to talk about today. So all of you who are watching and listening from, you know, far and near, in Aotearoa. Um, make sure that you pop your questions into our Q&A. If you're on the Zoom, if you're in the LinkedIn, I will check that and our YouTube or our Facebook. I'll see if there are any comments or questions there, but that's what I'm here for. And that's what Phil is here for. We're here to answer your questions so you can learn all about this. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Thank you, Phil. No problem. Oh, good to be here. Look, yeah, please ask, ask, you, ask us anything. Ask, you know, mm -hmm. uh, preferably relating to cybersecurity and privacy, but I'll do my best. Uh, uh, so look, you know, pop in a question. I'm really happy to answer things as we go or at the end. Um, so don't be shy. I know people are sometimes a bit shy with these things. So um, pop it in. We'll do our best to answer that. Sure. Right. Yeah. All right. Is now the time to uh, push the present button? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. So hopefully this is showing for everybody. Cool. All right. Thumbs up. Well, look, today we're going to talk uh, about three fundamentals around being cyber resilient. So three steps to protect your small business's future. So cybersecurity is sometimes a bit mysterious and sometimes one of those topics where it seems either really expensive or really hard uh, or really confusing. So uh, I'm here to share really three fundamental aspects to to, to protecting any organization with any sort of information. So basically everybody uh, that you can do right now by yourself, it doesn't take very long. And with a little bit of effort and application, you can do this immediately. Uh, obviously uh, I run a software platform. Well, I, I'm not obviously, I'll introduce what I do. So I'm Phil Howie. I run um, a platform called Omidly. We're a SaaS product. Uh, so I think a little bit like what Xero is for, for accounting, where you do that for security. So we're a cyber resilience platform for small to medium sized businesses um, to help you confidently improve your security and privacy maturity. Now, what does that mean? So it means we sort of stick everything on rails for you and make it really easy to sort of assess, plan, organize and carry out the work that's needed to protect your organization, whether it's things like putting policy in place, training your staff, uh, putting you know key bits of technology in to protect your information, and so on. There's a whole spectrum of activity, and many people are good at some little bits and pieces of that, but they don't necessarily have a holistic view of the, the whole program of work that needs to take place. So that's what Omidy does. It provides you a really a high-level context to govern everything relating to security and privacy, so your obligations under the Privacy Act that we have here in New Zealand, and actually beyond that internationally uh, as well. Um, so... Uh, my name is, like I said, my name is Phil. I My background is in product and engineering. So I was employee number one at a Kiwi company called Pushpay. You might've heard of it uh, last decade. And for my sins, survived about seven years in the startup rocket ship. And uh, I learned a lot 
really, and and from pretty much day one through to a publicly listed company worth a couple of billion dollars and uh, an extremely fast growth. And security there was really key, a very key consideration being a fintech company. Uh, I was really front and center in the coal face of dealing with a lot of a lot of that sort of work and took the experience uh, of managing a lot of that work at Pushpay and into my next venture and started Omidly. So Omidly is a, a product really that's designed for SME, so small to medium sized businesses that's affordable, actionable, and can really help you build a key capability very, very fast and manage it ongoing. Um, uh, in, in real time as well. So we're about superheroes. We're, this is Jester. You might have seen her on screen. She's our, our mascot. Uh, we designed her especially for uh, for Armand Lee. And, and our theme with Armand Lee is to take everyday people and turn them into security superheroes. So um, that's her. She's awesome. We're going to uh, illustrate a few more characters as well uh, in the coming the coming uh, near future. So she's not alone, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's our mascot in case you're wondering who she is. Cool. Well, today we're going to cover, like I mentioned, three fundamental aspects of information security practice. So this is really key for everybody, whether you're a one person organization, uh, you know, uh, battling it out, doing 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 some good work, self-employed or what have you, running a little key business, or maybe you're 10 people, maybe you're 20, or 20 people, maybe you're 50 people, um, e even hundreds of people in an organization need to do the same fundamentals. So we're going to cover those one by one. We'll spend a couple of minutes on, on each. We can talk to those. If you have any questions uh, about these, then feel free to pop those through again uh, into, into whatever chat you're looking at. Uh, and we'll do our best to answer those other as we go, but we'll perhaps at the end as well. So that all sound good. How am I doing so far? Good? Good. Cool. Okay, so look, uh, first first and foremost, uh, we're going to talk about protecting your identity. So fund fundamental to uh, the web and being online is protecting who you are. Now, what do we mean by that? If someone can impersonate you, whether it's they can send an email as you, or they can send a Slack message or a Teams message, or a, even a text message as you, then you've lost your identity. And keeping your identity as fundamental as, as it seems kind of obvious to protecting your information. If someone can impersonate you, they can gain access to all sorts of things. And so it's really, really, really critical, first and foremost, that we protect who we are online. And the way that we do that is we do things like we use strong passwords. Uh, so passwords, passwords, passwords. People hate passwords, I know. I hate them too, uh, but they need to be managed effectively. And what we need to be ultimately doing is using strong passwords and unique passwords for every service that we have. Now, I know this I is mean a whole order. Phil, I don't want to cut you off here, but it's just reminding me of like the times where I had like just a little post-it note with all of my passwords on it, like in my desk drawer, like that was, that was my life. And that post-it note might still be somewhere in my desk drawer. <laughs> Well, look, I mean, um, it's very common for people to use pretty much the same password for everything or have mm -hmm. some, maybe one or two variants of it that they kind of use for everything. Look, uh, one of the key things you can do is use a long password. So not necessarily a, a, a complicated one. So, you know, things like hash, hashes and weird numbers and replacing letters and things like that, um, that might that might have a little bit, but actually length is, is really the key. So a phrase, so maybe three words combined, something like that, uh, is, is much more effective because it essentially creates a level of complexity that computers would take thousands of years to hack. Um, so, oh, so that's interesting. So it says min when it says minimum eight characters, don't do the minimum of eight characters. No, no. Ideally, you know, something like 12 to 16 would be better. Um, much okay. better. And don't just use a word from the dictionary, right? Because uh, it's really, really common practice to essentially uh, try a bunch of, we're really commonly known passwords against some sort of service. And, and and unfortunately, humans are kind of predictable in that sense. And we think we're being really clever and uh, and you're not, you know, things can be guessed very easily. And so length is really key. So that, a key, one of the key strategies is like a key phrases. So you might take three, three words and essentially combine them together. Um, maybe even with like a hyphen in between. And that creates a level of complexity that would literally take, like I say, you know, thousands of years for computers to, 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 to try every iteration of that and solve. Um, obviously computers are getting more powerful, but just as fundamental. And what I encourage people to do as well is use a password manager. Now, sometimes, you know, operating systems and things kind of have password managers built in. So, you know, if you're using Mac, you kind of have this thing called Keychain and it might set passwords for you and then bring them back. And that's a really good start. Um, 
Windows, I'm sure, has the sort of the equivalent, and sometimes browsers like Chrome have it as well. Um, but you can use a, you know, a piece of software called a password manager, which essentially generates random passwords for you, saves them, and saves your secrets and, and, and keeps them much more secure. And it means that you know, if you're if you're using a service and that service has a breach and your password gets leaked out online, then the damage is limited to that one service and not everything you own, which is really what we're trying to avoid. So uh, you know, choose choose good passwords, choose unique passwords, and you try and use a password manager if you can. Um, there's a really great one called One Password. There's lots of other options as well. It's cross-platform, but you can use it on your mobile app and your desktop computer as well. Um, so then the next thing probably to talk about here is 2FA. So two-factor auth, authentication codes, uh, are really, really key in protecting uh, protecting the services that you have. They're just another line of defense, which makes it a lot harder for an attacker to get through that. Now, you're probably using them already on some of the services that you have, whether it's maybe your bank, maybe it's like your Apple ID or your Google ID or something like that. And the key thing here is to try and enable it for everything. Now, that might sound a little bit intense, you know, oh my gosh, everything, I'm going to be entering codes all day long. It's like, well, yes, you are. And that's the way to do it. This is unfortunately what we need to do to protect ourselves um, to that next level. So the reason we try to do it for everything is because some of the more minor things that you might use online can be used as escalation points. So if they get breached or if they get in somewhere like they can use that as essentially a way to communicate to some of those more important services or verify things and they can be escalated up to the really, really critical stuff that you need to protect. So turn it on for everything. Turn it on for your business email, turn it on for your messaging systems, turn it on for your bank, turn it on for the other software products you are using if you can, and turn it on for your personal uh, personal life as well. So uh, something that's just not as obvious is that, you know, if your personal email gets breached, that can be used as an attack, you know, essentially an escalation point into your business email as well. So please turn it on for your personal email. Please turn it on, you know, encourage your friends and family to turn it on for their personal email as well. Uh, and it may just protect you from, from, uh, from, from something, you know, much worse. So please turn it on and you can do that right away. It takes five minutes per service. Go and spend a little bit of time, look through those critical services and just turn it on yeah, and, and make it mandatory for your organization as well. Yeah, and I just want to really hit home because we had talked about this before, Phil, went, before we went live, your personal emails, right? <laughs> like make sure that you have 2FA yeah. for your personal life as well as your business life. Like it is so easy for, I mean, hackers are smart. They're smart. We're smart. We could, if we wanted to be hackers, we could figure it out too. Just get into the mind of a hacker and how would you get in? You know, it's not just like my next door, my 81 year old next door neighbor who doesn't know how to turn on her phone, but I'm going to hack, <laughs> you know, like, but I might. Quite nefarious. <laughs> well, look, the common scenario might be like, I, I'm busy. I, I'm, I'm in my personal email. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm at work and I get an email from the boss or someone in work and it's from their personal email address. And they're like, hey, it's me. I'm just in a rush. Uh, can you approve this invoice or can you make this payment or can you do, can you unlock this for me? I'm just busy at the moment. And you don't, you know, you might think that's, that's, you know, I know it's them, but if they've been, if they've been impersonated from their personal email life, uh, then, then you may, you may be giving critical access to people who shouldn't be having it. So uh, really, really critical to think kind of down the chain, how would people weasel their way into your digital world and they do it through, through personal, through the, the weakest link essentially. So yeah. And I think having these examples are really important for us to hear like that example you just gave, because it'll give us pause the next time that, you know, your boss sends something from their personal email. You might just go like, wait a second, where otherwise you're like, I'm busy. I'm stressed. I've got a lot to do. I've got to answer my boss, blah, 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 blah. Or I'm the boss. I need to answer myself. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And look, yeah. And, 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 and so the really, the, the really sophisticated attacks were things like people like you'll get an email from say your boss and then you'll get another confirmation from another colleague in the company saying yeah yeah can you approve this as well so you get two forms of validation both that might be false and you approve it and you make it go because you're like well i was asked to do that so uh it's it's it, we just have to be really careful and there was this is part of how we prevent that sort of thing from happening um the last point i guess on identity here and this is, there's a lot to talk about with identity but was just it's about careful we're sharing right so i know we like to kind of share logins to some things and like i'll just use my login to log into like this or linkedin or whatever it is um really careful with that the more people that obviously have those details uh, the more risk there is uh, and generally what we try to do is set, set up a, a unique account 
per service and delegate access to it. If you do have to share it, um, again, our password manager is a really effective way to share a complicated password with people without you know, texting and, and, and sharing things insecurely. So there is a, a better way to do this and that is with a password manager. Sometimes it's unavoidable. And uh, but there's a way to do this. Even you can even uh, you know share to a fake codes in that context as well. So there's there's a level of protection there. Um, but be careful with that. It's common with like social media logins and things like that, um, or even you know things like credit card numbers, all that sort of stuff. So just be mindful of of that. The more that you share, the more that it gets out there, the more risk there is. So something to keep in mind. Cool. So that is that is identity. Really, really important. Probably the funda most fundamental aspect of information security is protecting your identity. So uh, there are some things you can do right now in your world uh, after this webinar. Go and log into some of those key services. Turn two-factor authentication on. Consider a password manager. And if you're if you've got really terrible passwords, please go and change them to something much more much longer and more complex and unique. Especially, especially, especially for the very, very critical things in your world. So email, messaging, banking, things like that. Um, but ideally everything. So, and I think there was some talk in a, in a previous. Oh, we have a question, and I'll get to you in a second. Um, in a previous um, session, we were talking about not using your browser password manager potentially, like Google. I think Chrome has a password manager, and we were saying like those probably aren't as safe as using something that's really going to lock it down. Do you would you agree with that? I mean, look, it's safer than using nothing, you know, for sure. I mean, I, I, I Google takes security pretty seriously. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't. I mean, I think ultimately, probably uh, an independent password manager is, is best. Um, but look, if you, you know, if uh, the next best option might just be to use, you know, unique strong passwords that are that are locked away in, in like a browser context. I don't think that's a terrible thing. Um, yeah. It's certainly better than just managing them yourself on in your memory or on a spreadsheet or something like that, which people do, right? Or it's some sort of like note app you know <laughs> like please don't do that uh so look i think it's just various degrees of effectiveness here and if, if you can improve so if you can if you can go to the next degree from what you're currently doing then that's great so i wouldn't yeah. necessarily say that's that's a terrible thing it's just it's all relative right okay good to know and then a uh, question here if a friend is hacked can the hackers get through to me uh, it depends, right? Like if depends how they're hacked. Like if their email address is compromised, or their like their all their contacts and information are compromised, uh, then then they may end up tapping on your shoulder somehow. So, uh, yeah, I mean that is a that is a possibility. It, it really depends. So, like you know, I think if someone loses their Apple ID, for example, and like all their contacts and identity are all synced with that, uh, then they may be able to just text you or message you or send something to you impersonating that that person. So. Uh, yeah, like I would keep a I keep a lookout. If someone says they're hacked, I would, you know, if you think you're hacked, I would probably let people know as soon as possible, particularly key people in your world that, hey, look, uh, I may have been compromised. Can you just verify anything that you see coming from me in the, in the, in the near term while I figure this out? Um, I, a friend of mine actually got their Instagram account literally just taken over wholesale uh, not that long ago. They had a couple of thousand followers. The, the hacker essentially somehow bought access to their account online um super sketchy but it worked and they renamed the account changed the photo and started promoting says thanks through this instagram account which had thousands of people uh and this person my friend was essentially powerless they couldn't really do a lot they had to set up a parallel account um and try and sort of convince everyone to sort of follow the new one they eventually got the old one back but it was a it was a, like it was a nightmare it was an absolute nightmare so uh you know Again, really careful, really good passwords, 2FA, that sort of thing makes it a lot harder for those folks to, to gain control of accounts. Um, uh, you know, be careful with, you know, duplicated, like sometimes, you know, you might get a new friend request from someone you already think you're connected to. Maybe it's like on Facebook. I've seen this happen multiple times, the same photo, someone's, someone's essentially being impersonated um, against their will online. Um, so just kind of be skeptical, verify it. Sometimes it's really hard though, right? Like we're just busy, we get this thing, it looks it looks legit, and if unless you look very very closely for a long time, it can can often be quite hard to tell. So we just have, especially, you know, especially with this time of year, we've got couriers arriving, we've got parties to go to, we've got lots of stuff happening. Just paying a little, just being a little bit wary of of things like that, because this is this is the time that people like to kind of ramp up that sort of activity, because they know people are busy and they're likely to just, you know, be more forgiving of of that sort of thing. So. 
Yeah. So, but essentially I think what, um, the, so just to, to reiterate here, if your friend is hacked, they don't have access to your information just because they got into your friends, but they can impersonate. They've got yeah. access to your contact information, right. but they're not, they don't have access to your bank accounts unless you and your friend have a joint yeah. bank account. With them. I mean, look, I, I would be wary, you know, if you've, if you have someone you've shared a lot of information with and all that information is then mm. kind of, like, it, it's a risk, right? Like if you've shared bank account numbers and you've shared like, addresses and phone numbers and all sorts of stuff like that you know then uh, then that's probably a little bit of course for concern so i would i would be i'd be on the lookout i would be extra sort of uh, aware that maybe some of that critical private information has actually been compromised um so this is yeah. why we encourage our friends to take security seriously too because they they have a lot of information about us and uh, and if that information gets breached then uh, then you're you know you're kind of exposed a little bit by the fact by default so well, that leads us to this next question here, which says, when you say to put a 2FA on everything, is it easy to do? Could you give an example, say on Facebook or a common one that most use? Yeah, it, it's relatively relatively easy. I mean, some services make it slightly harder than others, but generally if you poke around in the settings long enough, you'll find it. It's, you know, it's in this usually something security or private and passwords and things like that. Uh, it's usually free. It doesn't really cost, you know, um, uh, and, 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 and obviously products like Facebook are incentivized to do it because the fewer breaches that they have, the better. So um, certainly social social media, social networks are really important. Banking should absolutely have it on if it's not already. Uh, things like, you know, accounting systems like Xero, I think I might have it enforced now. So some services are going as far as basically saying it's not really optional any longer, which is great. Uh, we don't make it an optional in our product. It's on by default. You can't turn it off. Uh, so, so that's a good thing. Uh, but if you're using CRMs, things like HubSpot, very much so turn it on uh, and, and find out a way to turn it on. I, I pretty much start by Googling how do I turn to FA on service X and I usually find their support article or something like that and just takes me straight to it. So um, do that, figure out how to do it and take the time. I know it's annoying. I know it's really annoying, uh, but <laughs> we've just got to do it. And it's just unfortunately the world that we live in at the moment, it will protect you. It's way less annoying than having your information spewed across the internet. So, And this is why we have experts like you on here, Phil, so that we can get educated and learn these, these styles and techniques and what we need to do. And even if it's just as simple as like Google 2FA, just take the time to learn. And once you know it, then you know it. Once yeah. you have that information, then you're educated, you know how to lock your door, you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. And there are, there are, if you want to get technical from it, there, there are authenticator apps or apps that kind of will generate codes for you. So you don't, you don't necessarily need to receive text messages, but look, a text message is certainly better than nothing. Um, but if you can do it without necessarily relying on SMS to do it, it's even better. But look, just start somewhere. Even if you have it turned on in the most simple way, it's far more effective than than not having it at all. So it's all about right, degrees, thank you. degrees of protection, right? Like there's the gold, absolute platinum standard, but it's, you know, if you're right down here, just taking the next step is the most important thing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Very cool. Back up your stuff. Mm. Uh, again, kind of simple, but hard to do. Uh, so what are backups about? Backups are about resilience. So we try to protect ourselves as much as possible. Unfortunately, no one can guarantee that they are 100% safe. It's just reality. If someone really wants to take you down, uh, they probably will if they have enough resources and, and power to do it. So backups are about fundamentally about getting back up. Um, sorry, didn't use the pun there, but the getting back up off the ground, it's about resilience and recovering from an incident or something that happens. Now, sometimes things might happen by default. Uh, I've been in scenarios where really critical data has been deleted by accident, uh, you know, Classic stories about, you know, some sort of uh, office, you know, tennis ball landing on a keyboard and pressing delete. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's less obvious than that. You know, people are working late and they press the literally press the wrong button and things are deleted. Or it could be, you know, it's something more nefarious. Someone actually gets access to things and deletes, deletes critical information or locks it, you know, locks it down. You can't access it. So backing up is about creating a copy of that information that's stored in a separate place ideally, that you know you can recover and get back up and running from. So we have lots of information in our organization. We have emails, we have uh, back office and calendars, we have files, and we have databases, we have all sorts of things. Um, some of those are a little bit easier to back up than others, but fundamentally we should be trying to back up critical 
information for our that that we use to run our business or that that is critical for our business to actually even exist. So uh, in the web, in, you know, in, the, in the product world, in the software world, it's often the production customer database that's the most important. So if that's to go, then you've lost your entire product and service effectively. Uh, and people are usually not too stoked to find that all their information is gone. So uh, that's one that's backed up and treated very, very carefully. But but things like email, and you know, email is important to try and back up as well. Obviously files, things like that, accounts, financial information, um, source code, uh, things that is you know that is commercially sensitive, legal documents, all those sorts of things um, should be backed up, ideally somewhere different to its original location, um, and it's about testing that regularly as well. So it's not enough just to have a backup; you actually need to be able to restore it, and that's an entirely different thing. So many organisations don't; they might think they have a backup and. They go to restore it, they find they didn't have a backup or it wasn't working properly or they can't restore it. So, you know, the gold standard is really having regular backups and regular drills to essentially test and restore those to, to, to regular functionality to see that it actually works. Um, so I have a question about that. And then we have a question in the chat as well. Um, how regularly, what is, what is regularly for you? Is that monthly? Is it weekly? Like, what would you recommend? Sure. Well, you know, a question to ask yourself might be, you know, how much, how much am I prepared to, you know, how much data am I prepared to lose? So mm. you know, if you wait 30, can you, are you prepared to lose 30 days worth of information if you only back up once a month? Um, are you prepared to lose a week's worth? Are you prepared to lose a day's worth? So, you know, you might, that might inform your decision about how regularly you want to do that. Uh, and, you know, cause, cause you will, you may end up losing a little bit as part of, as part of the process, you know, um, it's really hard to lose absolutely nothing, uh, depending on how much you want to throw at it, how how you know how how critical that information is. Um, but probably a good conversation to have with you know with a board or with a team to say, okay, well, if we were to have a breach, are we comfortable losing a day's worth of information? Two days? I mean, not comfortable, but are we? How much do really we want to throw at this? So I would say back up as often as you can. Uh, uh, that's that's not too cost prohibitive. And, uh, you know, data storage is pretty cheap these days. So I wouldn't, I think, you know, backing up sort of weekly or daily is not out of the question. Um, you know, in, in the production database world, you're effectively doing it more often than that as well. So, you know, we had a we had an incident in the last one of the companies I was part of previously, and uh, we didn't lose any information at all. Um, so that was good. It just took a long time to kind of recover and repiece it all, but we didn't lose anything. So oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. That good. Not always the, that's not always the case though. Um, and, you know, so you might back up really regularly and you might test it, say, monthly or, you know, test it a little bit less frequently, obviously, because you just need to verify that things are still working. But um, testing that perhaps monthly or quarterly, even quarterly is probably a good idea, too. Oh, that's great. So the question we have in the chat is, by backup, do you mean saving all of your work to the cloud or are there other ways to do this also? I think backup fundamentally means there's a copy of something uh that's in a separate place from its original location so you know you might have stuff in the cloud which is you know seemingly fairly resilient uh and you're not going to lose it due to necessary hard drive failure but if that's the only copy and someone gains access to that copy and deletes it then it's gone so uh it's not just backing up to the cloud it's creating a separate copy of something in a different location so with different user access so it's not just you know zipping everything up next to next to the original file location and putting it there and saying yeah we're cool because if that gets deleted then it's all gone. So it's about having a copy of the information in a different place under different access rules uh, from its original location. So you might have a bunch of files stored in Dropbox. That's cool, but but is that if that's the only location then they could be they could be compromised and deleted. So perhaps you have a different location or a different service that you store the really critical stuff in and you create a copy of it. If it's a production database that might be in Azure or AWS, but then you back it up and you store it in a different different place um, and all the way down. Even things like email can be backed up. There are services that which, which allow you to do that as well. So yeah, I'm just curious, is this a, is this a function of onwardly as well? Do you do backups through? No, website? we don't we don't we don't do backups per se. You know, we just mm -hmm. help people think about that and plan that work accordingly and report on it. So uh, so, you know, different technology requires lots of different sort of ways of doing things. So whether it's file systems, you know, email calendaring systems, production systems, there's lots of different ways to back that up. Um, but the point is to really, you know, really do it. So, 
Great. Thank you. Mm. So back up your stuff, people, and you know, do your do your per, do your personal stuff as well, right? Go make it personal. Back up your your photos and make sure you've got you know some of those key things. You know, people have kind of lost, for example, they've lost um, access to their iCloud account and the whole thing's erased, and and you're kind of yeah, it's game over. So please back up your personal information as well. Yeah, I think the last time we talked about this, those of you who've been following along and, and joining me on these pretty regularly, you heard my story about losing the whole second year of my children's life, like all of their photos are gone. Yeah. Year two. Yeah. Uh, yeah Cutest year. Cutest uh, year. <laughs> gone. <laughs> that's heartbreaking. I mean, I uh, I had a friend who sort of had like seven years of photos on some like old laptop, which was like 12 years old. And it wasn't, we weren't even sure if it was going to start, you know, and I said, okay, we need to get these photos off. And this is my this is my moral imperative to help you do this. And so I basically forced them to load their laptop out. We copied them off. Um, but you know, you know, things don't last forever. So so just be mindful of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Phil, your friend and I are kindred spirits, I think. New Year's resolution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay, cool. All right, we'll move on to the third one. So uh hopefully everyone's was still with us here. How are we going for time? Oh, we have 47 minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, so keep it up to date. So uh, update and patch everything. Now, most devices hopefully are set to auto update, but this is really, really critical. So security vulnerabilities are found in the wild all the time. So there are a bunch of professional people out there and some non-professional that are looking for vulnerabilities in the software that you use. So whether it's your operating system on your laptop, whether it's your phone, uh, whether it's some other piece of system that you use, there are people actively searching for ways to exploit that software. And occasionally... Uh, quite a major one might sort of be found, which has existed pretty much maybe for the last 10 years. So, uh, or, or or since day zero, effectively. And the manufacturers, so things like Apple and Windows and Google, uh, uh, Microsoft, they all pretty much urgent, urgently issue patches, hopefully, uh, and send them down the pipe. And so your computer will scream at you to update. So this is really, really critical that you actually do this. I know it's a pain but it's really critical. What I encourage everybody to do is set their laptops and their devices, everything as much as possible to auto update. So it'll be patched, it'll be regularly installed. Uh, you'll need to restart your computer every now and again. I know it's annoying, um, but let's just let's just do it. Do it once a week, do it once a day, whatever you need to do, but make sure you install those patches because they could protect you from some sort of exploit. And sometimes the exploits are crazy. Like you just open a web page and something compromised or you submit a form or you do something weird in a web browser and things can happen. So really, really important that you're patching things regularly. Now this might also extend to certain systems that you look after. So if you look after a software system, you've got a whole host of dependencies and libraries that will need to be updated regularly too. And sometimes there are various reasons why it's a bit hard to do this. There might be incompatibilities, incompatibilities introduced or major versions which require some code changes. Um, but really the most, the more often you can keep up to date with these on a regular basis, the easier it will be and the more protected you will be. So patching, patching, patching everything all the time is really, really, really important. Um, now, sometimes things change, people's cheese get moved. Uh, you know, you might sort of log in and suddenly the UI is different or something like that. Um, can be a, a sort of a consequence of updating things regu really regularly. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen too often, um, but it's worth it for the security protections that those those are involved with. So you, you, you need to restart your browser, you need to restart your laptop. Your phone hopefully might even just update itself overnight, um, but I really encourage people to just constantly patch and update things. Um, it will keep you protected. And because security, you know, there's a lot of people working really, really hard to issue security updates. Mm -hmm. Uh, and make sure that people are as safe as possible. So all you need to do is just download those and install them and restart. So really critical. And make it policy as well. So, you know, if you're in a business where people are bringing their devices to work, which is almost everybody, and they have maybe some, some company information on those devices logged into company email, logged into company chat systems, et cetera, um, then make it policy for people to auto-update as well. So, you know, if people are using... You know, devices in their world, whether it's work issued ones or personal sort of blended ones, then it's really critical that you just try and make that a policy for everyone and say, hey, look, I know this kind of sucks, but please, we need to auto update. We need to make sure that they're kept safe because we've got really sensitive company information on these devices effectively sort of right next to your personal information. So it's really critical that those are kept kept up to date. 
So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I think, and like you said, it's it's one of those things where we see it and we're like, Ugh, I don't want to update it. But you know, you hear so many horror stories about people update, updating their phone and losing photos and losing this or losing that or finding glitches with the updates. But that's not really what's happening here. It's really important. Security things are being updated. And I think that's the most important thing that we really need to keep in mind. You know, you see that little thing and everyone gets a little like, Ugh, just do yeah. it. I, I see people it. like webinars and they've got like Chrome open and it's like this little, this glowing red button saying, please update. And I'm, and I'm sort of sitting there like twitching because I think that, you know, they need to update this thing. And I know it's, I know it's annoying, right? Restarting Chrome could take longer than restarting your entire notebook. So, you know, it's, it's almost like an operating system in and of itself. So I get it. Uh, you know, I think browser manufacturers and device you know, operating systems are getting a little bit better at not destroying people's data when they update as well. Um, you know, I haven't seen that happen as much recently. It used to be a little bit fraught, um, but what they've essentially done is just they do it more often. So there's less delta, there's less change between each one. Uh, uh, it's not perfect. Look, I get it. Computers are hard, but um, uh, computers are hard. I know. It is hard. It's not hard, people. Public service announcement. Uh, so please, you know. It's a remarkable that it all works so well, to be honest. Uh, but so, but occasionally, occasionally it goes wrong. So update and, and you'll get bug fixes, you'll get improvements as well. So it's generally worth doing. Yeah. And a good point that you said that they're, the updates are coming more frequently. So it's not like you're going to have something really throwing anything for a long period of time. So if there is a bug that does happen, it'll get sorted. Yeah. And the more frequently shortly. you update, the kind of the less risk of something huge changing you know if you're updating from three major versions go like it's it's more likely something might go a little bit strange but uh, generally the more you update the the easier it is to update so particularly true with code libraries and things like that it's much easier to go from one major version to the other than it is three major versions right and people kind of get stuck sometimes they get stuck on old versions uh, where they literally can't update without major 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 changes so it's 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 kind of a it can you can get a bit trapped um, I know sometimes devices get a bit old and they stop getting updates. Um, you know, hopefully they get some security updates. But yeah, look, if your devices are extremely old, you are a little bit more at risk as well because again, does essentially stop updating them after a while. So um, yeah, that's true. So sort of yeah. that in your world, yeah, yeah. But always run okay. the latest. Whatever you can run on the latest thing for your device is good. Generally, good practice. Yeah. Lovely. We've got a question here. Um, I plan to import goods from overseas. So we'll have a website with a purchase portal on the website. Okay. Would you recommend getting a professional to do the website as opposed to doing your own on Squarespace, et cetera, in regards to keeping your website more secure? Good question. What do we know uh, about Squarespace's security and all of that? They take security pretty seriously, to be honest. I think uh, they're probably not a terrible option. Like I, I think they've got a team of people investing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in key in basically advancing security and practices across the hundreds of thousands of websites that they serve. So I think it's probably not a bad idea to use, um, you know, an off the shelf product like that. You're any, any fixes or vulnerabilities that are identified are immediately applied to those. So depending on your needs, you know, um, I think it's probably quite good to go with something like a Shopify or a Squarespace um, to start with. And then if you, if you really need to go custom, but the more custom you go, the more expensive it is and the more you need to kind of pay attention to the stuff, to security, you know, more and more kind of, um, if you get someone to custom, you know, to build this for you, there's a lot involved in that. Um, it doesn't mean it can't be made secure. It can be, uh, but you know, those services like Square, they deliver a tremendous amount of value for a very, very, very small cost. Um, so my, my general thought is to try and get as far as you can with those before you start writing your own code or, or custom developing something, depending on what you need. You know, if it's just not going to work for you, then I get it, sure. But uh, but you can do quite a lot with those. Um, so, you know, generally the more the less code, you know, that there's a saying in the software development world that the, the most secure code is no code at all. So it's the code you never had to write. Uh, any code you write is, is potentially has some sort of risk associated with it. So the fewer systems that you need to look after, the, fewer, the less code you need to write, the better, basically. Make it someone else's problem you know, if someone else is investing millions and millions of dollars in that, then just, you know, get on that train because they're doing some good work there. They can probably get you most of the way there as well, uh, would be kind of my thought. Yeah, thank you. I hope that answers that question for you. Um, any other questions that you have, just bring them on in. We're here. 
Shell, do you want to tell us a little bit about Onwardly? I'd love to know a little bit more about the platform and sure. how how it helps. I mean, helps businesses save time. Oh, quick question before you get onto Onwardly. What should we do with an old device? How do you close it all down? How do you close it all down? Close it all down, yeah. Well, that's a good thing, like disposing of devices, right? You want to erase them. Um, you know, some phones and even laptops these days kind of have a way to sort of reset themselves. Uh, really old ones, it's a little bit harder. Um, but, you know, for example, if you're in kind of the Apple world, there's an erase all content and settings. So don't just give a device to somebody still with all your stuff still on it, you know, erase it. Um, generally, they're, they're pretty secure at erasing things down to kind of nothing. So use that functionality. I mean, I even Google things like how do I, what's the safest way to dispose of, of this particular device? And often the manufacturer will have some, some information on that. Um, so you definitely want to erase them. If they're kind of just you know not being resold or something like that there are there are places you can sometimes donate old gear to and they will actually erase it for you you um, would hope right you hope like, they erase it for you yeah well you know they're, they're sort of trusted to to kind of do that job well that's kind of what they do so uh you know i would log out of everything for sure uh, i would try you know at the very minimum if you can't reset it yourself, then just log out of the key services, log out of your email, log out of all that. And that will destroy the authentication for that particular device and make it much harder to, for someone to just open it and re-log back in. So um, sign out of things, sign out of your Apple IDs, sign out of like um, your email system, sign out of like other services that you use. Um, really, really critical. Uh, uh, and, and try to erase them yourself. And if you can't, take them to someone who can do that for you um, and recite, maybe even recycle that gear. Um, if it's things like, um, you know, little thumb drives and stuff like that, I would actually just destroy them, you know, uh, don't, you know, don't leave them lying around, just actually destroy them. Um, you know, I've got uh, a shredder in my office, which I can shred things like CDs, not that I use CDs anymore. Um, uh, but, uh, but credit cards are another good one. You know, when credit cards expire and you get a new one, uh, you know, destroy it, you know, cut it up into tiny little pieces, you know, um, try and just discreetly um uh you know get rid of it um i put my credit cards through the shredder which is awesome um and i do that once every couple of years and occasionally i did the wrong one as well which is uh which is hilarious <laughs> but um you know destroy things securely like that particularly ones with lots of files you know it's really common to have usb keys kind of floating around the office and things like that um you should probably keep track of those right write them down and say okay there's actually this usb key maybe if you're you're hardcore put a label on it um, so people know what it is, but keep track of these things because they can have a habit of just disappearing. And that's not, that's not usually great. So, uh, 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 you know, all devices you want to dispose of carefully for sure. Cause people can open up hard drive, open up, grab hard drives out and then just have a full access to your file system, which is, uh, which is not ideal. So. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting, like how much you can actually access and mine out of these old devices, or like oh, yeah. you said, USB little USB sticks. I've got them all over the place. We have no idea what's on them. What's on those? Yeah, yeah, it's really common for people to like, you know, put a couple of gigs worth of data or something like that, and they transfer it to somebody else in the business. They sort of forget about it, and a couple of years later, it's still sitting there, uh, you know, um, for a visitor to the office to come and just pick up and walk out with. So, just be careful. You know, uh, and if you are going to put things on removable devices, just erase it as a matter of course. I, I do things like I put a reminder in my my own device to say, you know, erase this or unlog log out of this or change this, so that just I just don't forget. And it comes back up in a week's time or a day's time or something like that. So just practice it, clean up after yourself for sure. That is a really smart idea. Just giving yourself a reminder of when cleaning that all up. Yeah, okay. otherwise it's just there. It's a long time ago, so you know, I uh, I just rely on computers to remind me to do things now. <laughs> Uh, it's much more effective. <laughs> it's more effective for everybody. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, look, we're almost at an hour, so that went really quickly. Uh, so Omidly, so um, we've got a special uh, a special offer here as well. So what Omidly is, is a, is a software as a service platform which helps small to medium enterprise businesses, much like yourselves, I'm sure, um, build resilience both in the form of security and privacy. And so what do we mean by that? So we help you organize and plan all the activity you need to do to keep yourself safe. So in addition to the core fundamentals we've just talked about today, um, we have a whole lot more, whole, whole lot more things, uh, many more things that you can you can do in your world, practices you can put in place, um, uh, processes you can do, templates and policies you can apply to make sure that you are keeping your business safe, you are building resilience, and you are treating people's private information um, with care and respect. So privacy is a whole other sort of work stream 
alongside security, you probably have a privacy officer, or you should have uh, in every organization. You might not have thought about it enough, but we help you sort of develop competency around all of the privacy obligations that you have, which is just good for business, to be honest as well. So uh, we're 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 a platform. You can you can you can purchase us. Um, you can go to the link you can see on there, armadley.io/boost for a special offer for Boost listeners, um, and uh, and uh, we'll 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 love to talk to you. So please check us out, have a read, and uh, and if, if you think that this might be something you're interested in, then uh, please get in touch. That's great. Um, Phil, I was going to try and pop that into the chat here. Um, so you you keep talking while, cool. I, <laughs> while I pop that into the chat. It's onwardly.io slash boost. Um, that is a really generous offer. Thank you so much. And I see that you also have a free trial where people can trial onwardly. I, you know what I love about it is I love how you said it, it's like the zero for c- cybersecurity, right? So it's that kind of idea. You know, we do we have all our accounting in one place. Why not have our privacy and our cybersecurity in one place as well? And for those of us who are trying to figure it out, like some of the questions that came through, well, how do I do that? How easy is it? I mean, yeah, great. You can we can figure out how to do that on our own, and that's why we've got you here to give us these tips and tricks. And then we can also, you know, make the investment which I'm, I think it's pretty reasonable. Sure, we have, we have a startup plan for, for businesses that are really just kind of getting getting off the ground with Onwardly. We have a professional plan, which is, you know, if you're a little bit more uh, established and you need a higher level of sophistication there, we've got kind of everything for you there, uh, right up to sort of bigger businesses as well. So uh, uh, it's really affordable. And we even start to kind of resell some through some of our partners as well. So if you happen to, uh, you happen to be working with an IT professional or a security consultant already, um, you can you can get us through through them as well. Um, so you know multiple ways to kind of find us, but omni.io is, is a starting point there, and we're really built for small businesses in particular. So uh, you know we understand that it's complicated, that there's a lot of jargon. So we try to avoid as much of the complication as possible and make it really straightforward for people to follow and to implement and to build real genuine resiliency. You don't have to be a security expert. Um, you can either try and start, start to do this yourself and make some real progress, or you can work with a professional as well and, and uh, collaborate with them in the platform. So you can do it either way. Um, but the, the important thing is that you can make real world progress in your in your organization on, uh, on both security and privacy. I think that's important. I think it's really, it's a really, it's a great tool to have right now in this day and age, especially as we were saying, we're talking about this and people are like, what am I doing? So it's, it's brilliant. So I would say, you know, take Philip on that offer, although a digital boost, we don't have favorites, but I, I love the idea of this, um, this platform here. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, it's, a, it's an important communication tool as well. So like, uh, it's sometimes hard to talk about security. So, so part of what we're trying to help people do is really put some words around it and visualize, you know, their own level of progress that they're making. So uh, we, you know, we do all that as well. So yeah, check well, it out. And, and what were you saying about, you know, it's hard to talk about security. And it's one of those things where a lot of people who have been hacked or have had these situations and feel a lot of shame around it and don't want to talk about it and don't want to look at it. Um, it's important that we are talking about it and having this dialogue and having these discussions so that we all know like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just the more, you know, the, the safer you're going to be. And, and this is a fantastic tool for that. Yeah. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time. I know I love having these experts on and and you're just offering your time to us and we appreciate it so much here at Digital Boost. I love chatting with experts and learning more myself. And I know that everyone that tunes in loves to learn more as well. So um, I don't know, maybe we can get you on another time and we can talk deeper about some other things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Happy to talk. I, uh, I, I love doing this sort of thing. And look, thanks everyone for tuning in and, and, and listening. Hopefully you got something valuable out of this. You know, go and go and do some of these changes right now. You know, uh, don't delay. I encourage people to do just a little bit every day or every week. Um, set aside some time in the calendar and actually just kind of start to do this sort of thing. So um, it's really, really important. Your business, you've worked really hard for it. So protect it, please. And, uh, and, and you know, and be successful. So yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming along. And if any of you have questions while you're trying to do your two FAs or anything like that, you know how to find Onwardly, but you can also check us out at support at digitalboost.co.nz. Our support team is there for you waiting to answer your questions as well. It's not me. It's my friends. They're answering your <laughs> questions. <laughs> thanks again for coming along and I'll see you at the next Q&A. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for having me. Matewa.